We'll um, just wait for Uncle Robert to sit down and then we'll get on with the session. <laughs> um, well, good morning. Uh, Chris Chapman's my name. I'm the Chairman of the Australian Communications and Media Authority. I'm the, essentially the Executive Chairman, Chairman of the Authority, CEO of the agency. It's a wonderful corporate governance model and I commend it all to you. Um, there's an open invitation to everybody in the stage right um, to move along. It's an active exhortation, actually. Um, the room just seems a little biased, so if, if you would like to, if you don't have to, but it, it just might make more sense if, if those sitting on the extreme here could move along. There's lots of seats, and to be honest, <laughs> you've moved two seats. <laughs> Uh, to be honest, it's, it's, it's a lot better and warmer if um, you could move along here into these spare seats. Um, I, um, I wanted to uh, compliment Richard on the way he chaired the first session. It was a sublime performance, Richard, and uh, thank you for introducing me by saying Australia was going to chair the next session. For Sports Mad Australians to represent your country uh, is a wonderful honour, so I will consider that the first time I've worn the, the mighty green and gold. Um, I also wanted to, um, at the beginning, thank Andrea and her staff and Fabio as president of the IOC. Um, I've increasingly over the years had greater exposure to the IOC and I'm delighted to be coming a director later this afternoon. The IIC in its document, um, which has been going for 45 years now, um, says it, it's an independent, global, not-for-profit policy forum for the converging telecom, media and technology industries. Um, I, I, think it's, I think it understates what it does. I, I think the IIC is the world's leading independent, not-for-profit policy forum for the converging telecoms, media and technology industries. I think it consistently provides a framework and professional network for senior level strategists working at the intersection of business and public policy. For the community that we are, whether it we be in, on the business side um, or as advisors or as lawyers or within government or in my particular case as a regulator. And this last week with the uh, forum for regulators on Monday and Tuesday and yesterday and a terrific session this morning. This is no exception. In fact, it simply consolidates my impression of the terrific work the IIC does. Um, now, everything that has been um, discussed in the previous sessions has been a warm-up. This is the main act in this session. Uh, so no expectations on our speakers, but it was very important for me to underline that. In my usual way, I, um, in this uh, session, Global Spectrum Policy, Optimising Resource Allocation, Promoting Efficiencies for Broadband Wireless Rollout. Um, over the last couple of weeks, I have prepared a very extensive paper, which is my way of pulling thoughts together uh, when something as useful uh, as the IOC conference comes along. Now, it's not a paper that uh, I've published yet, but I will make it available to each of the participants in this forum over the next week or so. It's quite a sensitive document in that it represents a critique of the shortcomings of the Australian um, spectrum policy framework. Um, and in that sense, uh, I'm a bit reluctant to go too public with it, but I'm going to share it amongst this community in the spirit that the IIC um, perpetuates. Um, and that paper outlines nine general areas of reform, spectrum policy, which I am sure that Jessica and Ulf and Jonathan, uh, in their own particular areas of interest, will touch on. Um, I, I did want to, however, just perhaps to frame the specific focus on spectrum policy, um, hit on a couple of meta-themes uh, that keep me awake at night. 
the ACMA is the converger regulator in Australia for broadcasting, telecommunications, spectrum and the internet uh, and it's an extraordinarily broad and sprawling remit uh, and it is operating as we all very well know in tumultuous times. But uh, I just thought I would touch on the 10 things that do keep me awake at night. And uh, the punctuation point of that is that the spectrum component, which I'll get to at meta principle number nine, is the one that is least uh, part of my professional experience. It's the one I have least exposure to. Um, I was the, uh, a lawyer originally, managing director of a broadcasting network and headed up a major broadband ISP. Been in infrastructure development, built an Olympic stadium along the way and have now been chair of the ACMA for eight and a half years. None of which really touched on spectrum, but it is the area that fascinates me the most. And uh, it's the area that I've concentrated so much of the professional reputation of the ACMA, particularly over the last three or four years. So if you'll indulge me, I just want to touch on those 10 meta themes. First one is wrestling with the complex and, ant ant and antiquated legislation, potentially fragmenting institutional structures, both national and international, and the broken concepts that are highlighted by the increasingly uneasy fit of this uh, legacy legislative and institutional framework with the changing reality of communications. And with respect to the framework, I'm principally talking about that in Australia, but I discern it's true in other jurisdictions. The second is facing enduring content-related issues, ranging across persistent but variegated community expectations, convergent issues for broadcast media, particularly the increasingly stark contrast in the treatment of the same content on different media platforms, and wondering about the future proxies or mechanisms for the concept of influence, which has informed public policy formulation since the advent in Australia of electronic broadcasting. The third meta theme is in the context that telecommunications is now an essential service. It must be treated as such. The centrality of telecommunications in society has expanded, making the age-old issues of universal universality more complex and urgent than ever. There are, however, difficulties in clearly delineating the boundaries of a modern telecommunications network. And I think that our friend from Telefonica yesterday said if I quoted him correctly, there is no such thing as a telecom sector anymore. Um, so the difficulties in clearly delineating the boundaries of a modern telecommunications network, mobiles have become the main vehicle for voice and messages in telecommunications, compared with a fixed line telephone on which much of our existing regulation rests, which means that in a world of disintermediation and ever expanding value chains, Vigilance is required to ensure satisfactory telecommunication consumer outcomes. The fourth meta uh, concern, the shape and progress of a fully broadband enabled society. In Australia, this is being headlined by the transition to the National Broadband Network, Australia's largest ever civil engineering project. And, well, and when completed, will be a major change to the infrastructure layer, obviously, in Australia's telecommunications landscape. The fifth meta principle, the now inherent cross-jurisdictional international dimensions to our work. The consequent pressures on the traditional nation-state regulatory construct and the ever-increasing contribution of NGOs and the necessity and desirability of working with other jurisdictions and their agencies. And I can't stress this enough, uh, which has really been a very strong focus of the ACMA over the last three or four years, particularly in nuisance communications and in the online world. Sixth, building the capacity of industry to act as participants in the regulatory environment. Since particularly in the Australian regulatory construct, industry co- and self-regulation forms an important part of our landscape. This is an area of increasing challenge because of the high level of innovation that is occurring, volatility in industry structures, and my sense in Australia anyway that industry representative organisations are arguably not keeping up, uh, keeping pace with the dynamism of their industry groups and sectors. Seven, the dynamic, often highly contestable interplay 
between geopolitical tensions and terrorism threats and the palpably rising community fears and, as we discovered this morning, national safety and security issues, including e-security, telecommunications sector security reform and telecommunications interception issues, uh, and also uh, emergency call services and public safety communications. Eight, the developing domain of digital citizenship manifest as it is in cyber safety, online child protection, social media risk, identity, trust and privacy, and spam control. The demand side components influences that were touched on in the opening session yesterday. Spectrum. As Australia's Spectrum Town Planner, sensibly, equitably, and um, sensitively balancing the needs and expectations of established users of Spectrum with the burgeoning needs of new technologies and services, thus making it possible to efficiently and effectively optimise the possibilities offered by such technologies. And finally, as an overarching construct, as a meta concern, the regulatory agility, so I'm speaking from the regulator's perspective, the regulatory agility and effective fa uh, facilitation competencies, embracing where feasible non-regulatory solutions and program responses to problems because we now know in looking out over the horizon as we move from today's what I call interim state of convergence to the dynamic hyper-connected network society of tomorrow, and I've pinched that uh, all from Ericsson, will inevitably get tested, perhaps even blindsided, by something not currently on our radar. Now, everywhere you look, statistics are underscoring the daunting reality of these meta themes. These statistics are astounding. I'm not going to go into them this morning, but personally, I think, because personally, I think it's unproductive to get bogged down in the actual projected numbers. As we say in Australia, it's the trend line, stupid. To meet this tsunami in demand, it's clear that mobile broadband capacity is going to need to grow hugely, and Spectrum is a critical part, together with investment in reduced cell sizes and technological innovation in things like antenna design, encoding and compression. By this coming January, Australia will have 808 megahertz of Spectrum available for mobile broadband in high demand areas, with slightly less Spectrum available in our regional and remote areas. In our estimates, which were contributed to the ITUR report released in 2013, we estimated an Australian requirement for about 1,100 megahertz of spectrum by 2020. And this is where the spectrum planner role of the ACMA is so important. Being in a position to flexibly meet the needs of mobile broadband, but at the same time preserve the established utility of current spectrum use and be cognizant of the sunk investment and the cost of incumbent means that taking, you need to take a fundamental look at why and how we regulate spectrum for Australia and Australians. And this is indeed the context of the review being undertaken in Australia in which we're actively engaged. This current initiative in Australia, of all the 10 things that I've nominated as my meta concerns, is the only one where there has been an effective will to move forward. I think that's fascinating. Of those 10, the only one in Australia that has an effective will to move forward is in this spectrum space. Our regulatory uh, construct for, tele uh, for radio communications was established in 1992, and the complexities of management um, have taken us well beyond that, although it has served us well. We're 20 years down the track. Um, we see this review as an essential once in a generation opportunity to ensure we have the necessary fit for purpose toolkit to facilitate changing use of spectrum over the next 20 years. The most useful and comprehensive reform that could and should be undertaken, we think, is to introduce an enhanced and flexible licensing toolkit um, instead of the current threefold breakdown of licenses into apparatus, spectrum and class license categories. In our view, a parameter-based licensing framework that offers a continuum of terms and conditions would be best to position the ACMA and users to respond effectively, effectively to the challenges. 
I think it would be an extraordinarily beneficial world where a different communications uh, construct, a different spectrum management regime included the following, a parameter-based licensing framework, improved certainty around tenure and license renewal, recalibrated government interventions, broadcasting licenses reform, a wide range of incentive mechanisms for use by the spectrum manager, careful application of incentive auctions for spectrum refarming, and the ability for the regulator to designate band managers. We sense that we're in a sweet spot in Australia to make these changes. I'm quite genuinely hopeful that these changes will be effected by the end of 19, uh, 2015. Um, I think that Australia does have something to offer in this international spectrum regulatory framework, but I'm equally cognizant that Australia has a lot to learn from our international colleagues, which is exactly why I'm here in Vienna this week. I look forward to some stimulating discussion during our time together about how enhanced flex flexibility can provide spectrum regulators with the capa capa capability and capacity to assist stakeholders, be they government, industry, consumers and citizens alike, to benefit from these uh, future opportunities. I'm hoping that the panel will um, think that my meta concern number nine, the ability for the regulator to sensibly, equitably and sensitively uh, address these spectrum concerns is, is fairly in encapsulated. Uh, in fact, I expect them to have roll gold solutions for us. Uh, on that note, I just wanted to um, pause on those introductory remarks. It, it gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce Jessica rosen -Warsall. Jessica is a commission of the FCC. Um, the FCC has an extraordinary influence uh, through its work. Uh, it's not determinative influence, but it is an extraordinary influence. Uh, I think the FCC uh, makes an extraordinary contribution in many areas. The one area that yeah, I personally feel as a regulator I haven't had as much interaction with the FCC uh, is in this regulatory space. So I'm delighted that Jessica has been with us all week. Uh, like all of us, she would have an extraordinary busy schedule. Jessica has been a commissioner of the FCC for just over two and a half years, originally a lawyer, uh, worked at the FCC as a staffer, uh, has been on the Hill and uh, was appointed by President Obama uh, in the middle of 2012, I think, as commissioner. Jessica, welcome. We look forward to hearing from you. Well, thank you, Chris. I think to be informal, I'm just going to sit here. I think that was a great scene setter. I think also that you have a lot of things that are keeping you up at night, and I think it's going to be a long time before you sleep. <laughs> I, I forgot to mention jet lag as well. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, thank you also to the International Institute for Communications. It is a treat to be here in Vienna. The city is so beautiful, and the coffee is so strong. <laughs> so we're going to talk about global spectrum policy. And it's a big topic. Many of us here know that as regulators, but all of us know it intuitively because I would bet that everyone here has a mobile device, at least one, in their palm, pocket, or purse. And if you don't, the odds are that you left it in your hotel room and you are already strategizing about how you're going to go back and get it during the next break. But it's commonplace. As wireless service may feel in our lives today, I think we are just getting started as Chris said, it's tiresome to go over some of those statistics, but I'm struck by one. That over the next five years, globally, the demand for data wireless traffic is going to grow by 11 times. And by the end of the decade, we could be deep in the Internet of Things with more than 50 billion devices communicating wirelessly worldwide. So back in the here and now, we can wonder about that future. We can marvel about it but it would be a lot better if we just planned. Because spectrum is the consummate scarce resource. We are not making more. So what we're gonna do with it in the years ahead is really important. 
And I think to meet the growing demand, we're going to have to do three things. We're going to have to think about spectrum, we're going to have to think about technology, and we're going to have to think about network topology. With respect to spectrum, our policies for its allocation have to grow smarter. And with respect to technology, we are going to have to invest more in and deploy more of technologies like dynamic spectrum access and smart antenna systems and frequency agile radios. And with respect to network topology, particularly as we move to a 5G environment, we're going to have to spend a lot more time thinking about the big promise in small cells. I'm proud to say that back in the States, we are on it. We are proud that our 4G LTE deployment, we believe, leads the world. 98% of our population is now served by wireless at speeds of at least 10 megabits. I think a few things have contributed to our success to date. The first of that is spectrum auctions. For more than two decades, we have been auctioning off our airwaves for commercial use, and we believe that's an efficient way to distribute this scarce resource. The second thing that has contributed to our success has been a policy of flexible use licenses. Let's not leave it to regulators to decide what to do. Let's leave it to innovators in the marketplace. And the third thing has been the combination of build-out obligations for licensees along with the presumption of license <coughs> renewal. I think that's important because that's how we get deployment and that's how we ensure continued investment in our networks. But as they say, laurels are not good resting places, so I want to tell you a little bit about what we're going to be doing in the next year. Four things in particular. First. Five weeks from today, the FCC is going to hold its biggest auction of spectrum suitable for mobile broadband since we held our auction for 700 megahertz from our digital dividend. To put that in more colloquial terms, we are going to be holding our biggest auction for mobile broadband since the iPhone was in its infancy. We've got 65 megahertz of broadband just below 2 gigahertz that will be up for auction, and we've got a lot of applications for bidders. We're very much looking forward to this auction and believe it will yield billions of dollars in revenue. Second, we're not limiting ourselves anymore to traditional spectrum auctions. We are going to be holding the world's first voluntary incentive auction. This is an elegant concept, but I will be the first to admit it is also very complicated. We are going to invite our broadcasters on a voluntary basis to exit the business of providing broadcasting services. So we are going to invite them to return their airwaves to the FCC in exchange for a cut of the proceeds from the subsequent re-auction of their spectrum for new mobile broadband use. So this means we will free up more desirable low band spectrum in the 600 megahertz band for mobile use. Like I said, it's complicated. We're actually going to have a two-sided auction. The first half is a reverse auction to secure spectrum from broadcasters, and then we're going to follow that with a forward auction to sell it off to mobile operators. And in between those two activities, we are going to repack the remaining broadcasters in the 600 megahertz band so that we have contiguous swaths of spectrum to sell. So now that I've conveyed this to you in all of its glorious complexity, I also want you to continue to pay attention because I think if we get this right, we will have a tremendous tool for reallocating our airwaves, not just in the 600 megahertz band, not just in the United States, but a tool that could be used and reused worldwide. So stay tuned. Third, we believe in the power of unlicensed spectrum. We think it's time to retire the tired notion that pits unlicensed airwaves against licensed airwaves. We have come to the conclusion that a good national spectrum policy requires both. Let me give you a few reasons for that. First, when we started studying unlicensed spectrum in the United States, what we found is it contributes $140 billion in economic activity 
to the U.S. economy every year. And by any measure, that is big. So we want to see that grow and continue. Unlicensed spectrum through Wi-Fi, particularly in the 2.4 gigahertz band, has been an important avenue for internet access for many people in our country, so it's important for that too. It democratizes access to the web. But I will also add that it's important to remember that one half of data connections in the US are now offloaded from licensed spectrum to unlicensed spectrum. So it may not be intuitive, but having unlicensed spectrum improves the value of licensed spectrum. Because having unlicensed spectrum smooths the experience of those who use our licensed airwaves. So now that we've committed to the idea that unlicensed should be a part of our spectrum ecosystem and our markets, here's what we've been doing. In the last few months, we set aside 100 megahertz of spectrum in the 5 gigahertz band. We literally doubled the capacity of unlicensed in the 5 gigahertz band overnight. Now that's high band spectrum. Its propagation characteristics are, are not that sweet, but this is spectrum that is particularly useful for home Wi-Fi networks, and we think that <coughs> enhancing capacity of those is going to be important. But we're not limiting ourselves to high band spectrum, and that's important. We are looking at offering unlicensed spectrum in the 600 megahertz band, so low band as well. And our goal there is to make opportunities in unoccupied television white spaces in 600 megahertz, as well as the guard bands that will exist between mobile broadband and broadcasting following that incentive auction I talked about just a moment ago. So beyond unlicensed, the final thing that we are working on right now is we are starting to experiment more with spectrum sharing. It's clear to me that today, spectrum clearing is the gold standard. Exclusive use is what most of our operators are looking for. But it's also clear to me that in the future, things could be different. And so we are exploring this, particularly in the 3.5 gigahertz band. So if the future is going to involve sharing with the spectral, geographic, and temporal basis, our first big experiment is in 3.5 gigahertz. And right now, we're proposing in that band a three-tiered model with priority first for incumbent users, largely government users, followed by priority access licensees, and then followed by general access for users on an unlicensed basis. I think this is a really neat model it's going to be a test case for how sharing could work, if sharing works, and on what kinds of bands with what kinds of services. And we anticipate using a database manager, much as we've developed in, with television white spaces. So again, this is another one of those areas we're working on right now, and I'd encourage you to stay tuned. So those four efforts are the foundation of the here and now in FCC spectrum policy. We expect our upcoming traditional auction, our innovative voluntary incentive auctions, our work with unlicensed airwaves, and our experiments with sharing to yield lots of dividends. I think we're confident that it will uh, be productive for our wireless economy, but I'm just as confident that the demand for spectrum is going to keep growing and that we're going to have to start looking more at small cells and really high band spectrum as we navigate the road to 5G. And as we do that, I really do hope that the FCC shares its own strategic insights, but that also will learn from the world community because I think we're all struggling with the demand for our airwaves right now. And I think by sharing ideas in fora like this, we can all make progress together. Thank you. Jessica, thank you very much. There's lots there to mine later. Um, so we'll, I'll next move to Ulf Pearson. Ulf is the uh, Vice President of Government Ind Industry Relations with Ericsson. Again, very deeply experienced uh, in all facets of telecommunications, communications generally. Um, has taken, I know, particular interest in developing stakeholder relations with 
government regulators, not only in his own country but around the world. Uh, and I think it's uh, a reflection on Ulf's input that Ericsson is such, to me anyway, an impressive company. It's very transparent, it makes enormous investments in these sort of forums. Uh, its research is quality. I like the way Ericsson goes about its business and uh, delighted that Ulf's on the panel this morning. Over to you, Ulf. Thank you, Chris, and, and thanks for that introduction. And uh, of course, thanks to, to I, IIC for, for inviting me to this very, very important uh, conference. Today, I, I will talk about the, the network society that you, Chris, already referred to. Uh, I'll also talk about the increasing performance requirements on mobile broadband networks, uh, talk about 5G that Jessica just uh, referred to, and of course, what all this means for, for, for Spectrum. So at Ericsson, we work towards this vision of the network society, as we say, where everything that benefits from being connected to the network will be connected. And where we as a society take full advantage of the benefits of everything digital uh, uh, across the wider economy. Uh, and we are well on our way. I know uh, there was a hesitancy to, to quote numbers here, but I, I'll take the risk anyhow, because uh, I'll pick some numbers from, from the latest version of the Ericsson Mobility Report. Uh, we see now that mobile broadband subscriptions are at 2.4 billion. They will grow to 7.6 in the next five years by 2019. And in the past 12 months, we saw a 60% growth in, in data traffic and mobile networks. We estimate an increase not of 11, but 10 times, but I mean, I'm sure it will be something else. But I mean, the growth is just uh, amazing when it comes to, to, to data in, in mobile broadband networks. And when it comes to number of subscriptions, they grew by some 80 million in the last quarter, and almost half, 35 million, were actually on 4G LTE. Uh, and we, we see that uh, uh, 4G LTE subscriptions will reach 2.6 billion uh, uh, five years from now. So, in a 2020 perspective, with everything connected, uh, new lifestyles uh, will emerge, affecting both our personal, professional lives, and as well, it will affect how our, our society will, will function. And, and obviously, there will be room for completely new business models, some of which have already started to emerge uh, in, for example, transportation, commuting area, based on extensive sharing and, and collaboration. And therefore, we can expect that mobile broadband networks will have to meet increased performance requirements in areas such as coverage, capacity, and, and speed. So there will be demand for network coverage everywhere. Everything from connecting the, the utility meters in your basement to connecting uh, pupils in, in schools in, in remote and, and, and today underserved areas. Network capacity will have to support everything from billions of sensors for telemetry to high definition video streams when you are at the cricket stadium, Chris probably, or at the soccer stadium for the rest of us. Uh, ultra high speed connections with very low latency uh, will be able to save you from traffic accidents and to manage the electricity grids. So I think it's safe to say that the network society will be able to address many of the challenges that our society stands before in a broad set uh, of aspects. So at Ericsson, uh, uh, we are at the forefront of the global and, and European uh, mobile industry. We invest $5 billion per year in research and development. Uh, that is in, in uh, infrastructure, hardware, software, but also services. And our focus is to develop mobility, broadband, and cloud. We believe these will be the three pillars uh, uh, of technology for the network society. So, uh, of course, we, we have been uh, part of, of, of bringing mobile telephony and mobile broadband to the billions of consumers. Uh, uh, we are now uh, leading the world in rollout of 4G LTE, and we will continue to do so in the large engagement in the development of 5G, which will be introduced in the time frame of 2020 or so and, 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 and beyond. Uh, and just to mention also uh, a, a global trend we see, namely the urbanization. Uh, we, we see that the need for bandwidth will definitely be propelled by the increasing number and density of people living in cities using demanding audiovisual and social networking applications, as well as, by, of course, by the integration of vertical markets in areas such as education, automotive, healthcare, etc. And these applications will need very dense network structures. And this shifting demand in many countries uh, will be imposing new demand 
on mobile broadband networks at the time 5G will be deployed. As an ever-increasing number of people are moving uh, uh, to cities, every hour actually the global urban population increases by some 7,500 people. Five million new urban citizens added every, every month. Uh, so investment in, in 5G infrastructure will be of great importance for these cities to, to, uh, to be efficient. And this is underlined by the fact that the top 600 cities of the world actually produce 60% of, of the global GDP, uh, still only 20% of the population is there. So measures taken by policymakers, including the necessary spectrum regulation, to a great extent will be defined by the needs of the large cities of this world. And uh, already 60% of mobile broadband traffic is actually generated in, in the most dense cities of, of the world. So what about 5G? Well, we see that the second, third, and fourth generation technologies, as well as the new 5G uh, technologies uh, that will be developed, will form an integral 5G technology uh, platform, network platform. While the use of and handover, of course, between these different generations uh, should be uh, transparent and seamless for the consumer's point of view. So, however, providing connectivity in rural areas and other underserved areas will still be presenting significant challenge because of, of course, of the high cost and, and, and the, the low revenues. So, because as we see it, rolling out 5G in the higher bands, uh, as we see it, above 10 gigahertz, will largely satisfy the needs in suburban, urban, and metro areas for improved capacity. So uh, this, of course, leaves us with a challenge that we need spectrum to meet the need of remote areas for coverage, uh, uh, which is indeed an uh, 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 even more urgent matter. And, and we believe that this needs to be addressed uh, at next year's World Radio Conference in, in November uh, uh, 2015, the WRC 15. So, so this lower spectrum is urgently needed to allow for the rolling out of advanced uh, 4G networks below one gigahertz, including in the 470, 694, 698 band. Uh, uh, for underserved regions. And of course, later on, these 4G networks will be, be uh, uh, forming part of 5G. But back to 5G. So exploiting the very high peak data rates for 5G will, as we see, place demands for very large bandwidths, which by necessity will be identified in now uncontested areas of the higher end of the radio frequency scale, primarily in the range of 10 to 100 gigahertz that is what is usually called the SHF, the, the uh, super high frequency, and the EHF, the extremely high frequency ranges. And with 5G still some years away, predictions are of course uh, uh, somewhat speculative here, but we, we foresee that channel bandwidths are in the order of 100 to 500 megahertz in the lower bands, and, and possibly bandwidths up to two gigahertz uh, in the higher frequency ranges uh, uh, will be, be uh, very likely uh, be, be needed here. And we talk about the speeds. We, we believe that 5G systems are expected to be able to provide peak data rates in the order of 10 to, to 100 gigabits per second, of course, subject to the bandwidths uh, uh, which will be acquired. So the identification, allocation of new spectrum for mobile broadband is perhaps the single most important ICT question in Europe and the world, the main act, as uh, Chris uh, uh, referred to. And uh, talking about then the international process, the World Radio Conference is extremely important. I already mentioned the need uh, for, for uh, spectrum uh, for 4G below one gigahertz in next year's conference. But as important in next year's World Radio Conference, uh, there, there is a need to already uh, define an agenda item for the next uh, uh, World Radio Conference, 2018, 2019, uh, for 5G spectrum uh, to allow uh, security for industry to develop the 5G uh, solutions. So that being said, and, and also listening to, to, to Chris's introduction here of, of, uh, uh, to create this agile and, and, and fit to purpose uh, 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 spectrum uh, allocation model, uh, uh, we believe, uh, as you already been, been, been uh, alluding to, we need, need new approaches in order to secure that. Uh, and, and with a purpose to best incentivize, of course we have the US example, the FCC example, to incentivize public spectrum owners to identify and release underused spectrum, but also important as we see it, that there is a cost 
associated uh, with all spectrum uses, because this is a, a very valuable asset for the whole of society, and also, of course, a secondary trading is, is allowed. So, so just to sum up, uh, our world must reach its, its uh, full potential ICT advances with, with the 5G uh, as one of the key enablers going forward. And we must avoid emulating the old world. We need to do things differently. And, and in order to get there, uh, industry, ICT industry, and governments must work uh, together, more emphasis on cross-sectoral ICT uh, policies. And we believe that policymakers has a role to, to uh, promote uh, digitization of sectors of the economy, uh, leading to increasing choice in markets, more competition, more innovation. And if we can remove uh, barriers such as cumbersome uh, regulation and not least, of course, spectrum scarcity, referring again to agility and, and fit to purpose uh, uh, models, uh, we believe that ICT can support development society as, well, the, as well as development of many industries. We see that happening already now. So the user demands and the t t technologies are definitely there. Thank you very much. Um, well, thank you very much. Um, I know Richard referred earlier in the first session to the Intermedia magazine, and I think on that particular occasion it was the Big Data with Andrew, Andy Hare co-authored uh, on page 16, but uh, you know, when you've got a moment you should read the article by several um, Ericsson researchers uh, on 5G, time to plan now on page 31. Fascinating insight into 5G, what it means conceptually. Uh, one of the big things that stands out in that article and for me is the necessity to WRC 15 plan for 19 and that's how far ahead we are. We know that but we take these things for granted sometimes and a lot fall between the cracks. I've been to WRC, I've headed up the delegation there. WRC is not a pretty process and everyone says well at the end of the day you just work later into the night and you compromise towards the end and you get there. Um, but I think what Ulf was saying and what I was certainly saying in the Australian context is we need a total reformation of the way in which we plan a spectrum. We need a first principles analysis, we need a root and branch analysis uh, and I would like a totally flexible toolkit. Um, Jessica touched on it in her remarks when she talked about the um, the necessity, the opportunity to experiment. And I know in a session earlier in the regulators forum, she spoke about embedding toolkits, uh, sand, sandboxes in, um, in the way in which they go about it. And that's a very interesting idea as well, and we might explore that a bit later. So, uh, so far, Jessica has outlined the four very real matters that the FCC in the spectrum space is working on and will be delivering before Christmas. Uh, Ulf has um, expanded our knowledge and um, exhorted us to get our act together with respect to uh, what we need to do for 5G in WRC, fi WRC 15. Uh, slightly different perspective, Jonathan Thompson is the CEO of Digital UK. Um, Digital UK had a, the leading role in the um, switch over uh, from um, analogue to um, uh, digital and, and the um, switch off of the simulcasting. Uh, these days they have the principal lead coordination and management role for the terrestrial and digital broadcasting uh, in the United Kingdom. Uh, it's an area of particular interest to us because in Australia you have the broadcasting services band are in effect given special treatment and are quarantined in Australia and that special treatment and quarantining is under enormous pressure as we go through this review. So I'll be very interested, Jonathan, in your observations as to where to. Welcome. Thank you, Chris, very much. Um, I think I'd like to start by picking up on something I think actually Chris referred to in his, in his opening remarks, which is I think he made the link between the similarities between spectrum planning and town planning. And I know that's, that's a relatively well-used metaphor in this field, but I think it's one that has more resonance than ever before. Um, both those entities, both those activities, involve the allocation of what is clearly a very scarce and very valuable resource. Both require uh, striking a balance and making trade-offs between the economic and social value that flows from the use of spectrum. And both also need to balance the need to both uh, serve the needs of incumbent users of spectrum, 
but also allocate spectrum to new entrants who offer future value. Um, now, I've been able to see this debate from both sides to a certain extent. I've been both a policymaker and a practitioner. I've worked at Ofcom uh, for a number of years, and also most of my background has also been in broadcasting. And that's allowed me to see that how the theory of spectrum policy and spectrum management, which is rooted in the principles of liberalization and a market-based approach, doesn't always work in harmony with the practicalities of how spectrum is used by both industry and by consumers. Now, clearly in an ideal world, we'd, we'd have a crystal ball and be able to look 10 or 20 years ahead, tell ourselves what the world is going to look like, and make, decision that, make all the decisions now that allowed us to get there. That would be great for policymakers, but of course the truth is that is not what the real world is like. And I think there is a risk in this approach, is that it starts to bind us to an outcome that's determined by technology rather than determined by consumers. So as I said, and as Chris introduced, I uh, represent Digital UK, and we represent the interests of the, terrestrial bro the major terrestrial brokers in the UK. So I come at this as an incumbent user. What I really wanted to cover this morning is three points. Um, what, first of all, why broadcast television remains a vital part of the communication sector. Second, how we are responding to the pressures that the other panelists have already talked about in terms of spectrum use. And thirdly, to set out why I believe that certainty and a balanced evidence-based approach to spectrum policy is the best way to ensure that we get the economic and social value from its use. Like the other panelists, I'm going to start with the communication sector, but I'm not going to bore you with lots of statistics. I mean, I think we all know the change that's going on, whether it's talking or texting, watching or listening, uploading or downloading. People's appetite for technological innovation, technological change is unsatiable. Um, Ofcom published some research this summer that highlighted that the average UK adult now spends more time using media and communications than sleeping, which is a rather worrying thought. But despite all this connectivity at our fingertips, we're still managing to, certainly in the UK, we're still managing to watch almost four hours of live te television a day. It's still the activity that most, most UK consumers spend most of their time on. In the UK, again, TV saw the largest rise in UK communications revenue, and it is making the UK's creative industries the fastest growing part of the economy. Part of the reason for this is that we have a healthy, competitive television market in the UK, and it's underpinned by the health of a free-to-air television platform in DTT. In the UK, almost 20 million homes, that's roughly 75% of all television homes, rely on terrestrial television for their, uh, for their broadcasting. In Europe, that figure is 250 million. We're seeing that despite the technological innovation, most of that viewing remains live broadcast television. And the emergence of new players and new models consum of consumption is not destroying the traditional model of television, but I would argue is actually enhancing it. Consumers have more choice and more flexibility and more control over how they consume content, but they just simply haven't fallen out of love with the live experience of broadcast television. But we're very clear that nobody has a God-given right to Spectrum. And with a public resource of any kind, whether it's public land or Spectrum, when it's limited, any user clearly needs to demonstrate that it's using it both efficiently and is driving value from its use. We are trying to play our part in that. And the first part of this is obviously through Spectrum release. As Chris mentioned, we completed digital switchover in the UK in 2012, uh, and that released a major tranche of spectrum that is now being used by the mobile op operators for the launch of 4G. There are plans ahead for uh, the potential release of the 700 megahertz band currently used for broadcasting and is likely to be released for further use by the mobile sector later this decade. Now, we can make all of this work as long as we learn the lessons from switchover. Switchover was a success in the UK, not just because of inter intervention from policymakers, but because all the parties involved, broadcasters, manufacturers, network operators, and, consumers group, and consumer groups, had a shared understanding of the process and the high levels of collaboration required. The next challenge ahead is spectrum sharing. Um, terrestrial television in the UK actually already actively shares its spe spectrum with a thriving program making and special events sector. And when the technology is ready, there are proposals uh, for the terrestrial television network to be shared with new white space devices. We're very open to spare, uh, sharing spectrum as long as the interests of our viewers are protected. And we're also improving the efficiency of how we use our network. In the last few years, we've rolled out high definition services on digital terrestrial in the UK using the latest compression technologies in DVB-T2. We're very aware that we're entering a hybrid world. 
where it's mobile, fixed internet, and broadcast networks which will coexist to provide the choice, competition, and innovation that consumers want. Connected TV, we're very clear, is a vital part of the future, and we have our own plans to roll out a proposition that will build the best of broadcast television and the best of on-demand to meet the growing appetite of consumers. But if we are to do all of this, and we are to release another chunk of spectrum in the UK, we do need certainty on what remains. Because it's this security that will help sustain, sustain the investment the platform needs. That's why we greatly welcome the report that was delivered to the European Commission last month by Pascal Lamy. Lamy's 2025-30 proposals, which I'm sure most of you will be aware of, represent a pragmatic approach to UHF spectrum, which balances the potential long-term use with what the evidence tells us about the importance of broadcasting for the foreseeable future. This approach, which puts consumer interest at the center of decision-making, is the only way to ensure we get spectrum policy right. And I don't think anyone would deny, deny that demand for mobile data is increasing, but I think it is worth acknowledging, acknowledging that the extent of that demand is now being challenged. We have seen downgrades in the forecasts and question raised over the modeling and the, under, and the assumptions that underpin what are major policy decisions, most recently a report published by LS Telcom that I'd recommend you have a look at. So I'm pleased, therefore, that it appears that a sensible approach to spectrum allocation does seem to be emerging. Mobile clearly is a vital part of our future, and it, it as an industry needs a spectrum that underpins its ability to innovate and develop, and I don't think anyone in the broadcasting sector would deny that. But the pleasing thing is that talk is no longer of a future that is entirely online and mobile, but one that combines the best of IP, mobile, and broadcast. In recent months in the UK, we've seen both the government and Ofcom clearly acknowledge the ongoing importance of broadcast television. Ofcom themselves have set out their position to oppose co-primary for the lower bands at WRC 2015. And we will welcome this support and also do all we can to ensure that the UK is sending a clear signal to the other countries involved in that important conference next year. So to return to where I began, whether you're an end user of land or spectrum, I think what everyone wants is to ensure that not only do they have access to the innovations of tomorrow, but they also have certainty to the services they value today. And my simple message, in a way, is hopefully, collectively, we can achieve that outcome. Thank you very much. Um, Jonathan, thank you. Fascinating uh, contribution. Um, again, many issues raised uh, from the perspectives you've put forward. Uh, we might just take, at this stage, questions from the, from the audience. So. Um, you might want to put it to all the panellists, or you might want to specifically put it to... Yes, start with you. If I could just ask again... There's a microphone down here, please. If I could just ask you again to um, uh, tell us your name and uh, indicate uh, where you're from and uh, perhaps just outline the context of the question, that would be terrific. Thank you. And then... I think it just went on as you... Hello? Okay, now. Yeah. Jussi Kähtäär from Eurolight Spectrum Associates, independent consultancy. I have a question to Jessica on the 35 megahertz band. And um, as you referred to that, uh, FCC has been for a couple of decades now been promoting auctions and uh, flexible spectrum licenses. And obviously today these mainly work in the framework that when somebody is getting the assignment of spectrum, it, they had the full rights of use, so they had a license they can sell that onward and so on. And the interesting aspect on this 35 megahertz, then, when you had the priority access layer, which is the, the middle part, I would show it's to some extent similar to what we are working in Europe with the license shared access. And in this case, obviously, you would not give the full rights of use for the PAA user because you had the government incumbent over there and also the general access. So can you shed any light on how FCC is planning to do the, first of all, uh, the evaluation of the 35 megahertz licenses for the priority tax layer, how they would be auctioned, and because that seems to be quite different from what they would do on the normal spectrum auction. So any, any, have you had any details on how you plan to go forward with the so PAA how, layer? So how we're doing it in the 3.5 gigahertz band? We're just getting started, so I can't 
candidly answer that question. But I think it's an interesting experiment, recognizing that we're going to have to think about sharing, not just between commercial users, but in many cases between government users and the commercial sector. <clears throat> so we've just started the conversation about it, and we don't, in fact, um, have a scheme that's fully in place right now. So uh, like you, I'm interested in seeing how we're going to work out all of these details, but I think it's an interesting thought exercise right now that I hope becomes a reality. Thank you. I think there was a, another question here, was there? Uh, just, uh, just over there. Thank you. I'd, Richard, I'll just come to you first, and then I'll come back. Uh, uh, Richard. Uh, Richard Hooper, I've got two Cinderella questions, one for Jessica and one for Jonathan. And the Cinderella questions are about fixed wireless and radio. Um, Jessica, in shaping broadband policy in the UK, um, fibre is obviously very sexy. Mobile's pretty sexy. Nobody ever mentions fixed wireless. I'd love you to just talk a little bit about your views on that. And the other Cinderella is radio. I mean, Digital UK, brilliant job on switchover of television. Switchover of, you know, radio doesn't get mentioned in this, in this organization. Radio is still hugely watched, terribly important in developing countries, terribly important in, in developed countries. Why is digital radio switchover such a running disaster in the UK, Jonathan? Do you want to? Why don't you start? Uh, okay, so, well, thank you for the question, Richard. Um, <laughs> the first thing I just want to make abundantly clear is that digital radio has nothing to do with me or my organisation. <laughs> um, to give you a serious answer to your question, I mean, I think there are, it has been challenging for digital radio, I think that's uh, certainly in the UK. Uh, I'm not an expert, so I, mean, I wouldn't try and give you a full answer. I think there are two inherent challenges that perhaps weren't apparent in broadcasting, one of which is the spectrum that the broadcast television platform was using was highly valuable. The spectrum that's being used by DAB in the UK is not particularly valuable, and my understanding is the only, other, the only alternative use is more radio. Um, so the incentive isn't there perhaps in the same way for policymakers to drive clearance in, in, in the way there is for broadcast television. I think the other thing that is challenging for consumers um, is the, com uh, the uh, consumer proposition of DAB is not incrementally better in a way that, uh, to, to analog that television it was. Uh, so I'm sort of, I'm, you know, joking, joking aside, I'm slightly glad it's not my challenge. I think it is very, very difficult. Uh, fixed wireless. It is definitely part of the conversation. I'd agree with you it's not been front and center in our recent spectrum dialogues, but let me give you an example about where we're thinking about it. Right now we have a proceeding at the FCC that we call the IP transition. And in effect, we're trying to understand if it's still valuable to have a copper line into every household in the country. There's this infrastructure we're very proud of. It was a democratizing thing to make sure that we connected every household particularly in a country where we have some very rural and remote communities. But now we're trying to rethink, is that the best use of modern infrastructure? And how do we deploy fiber further and farther into our networks? And also, are there some locations that could be better served today with fixed wireless solutions rather than traditional copper? Uh, Augusto Preta, Italian consultant. Um, this is a, a question for Jessica. Uh, you know probably there is uh, the LAMI report uh, in Europe now which uh, provide a deadline for the uh, 700 megahertz use from broadcasting to uh, mobile. Uh, my question is from your speech it seems that uh, you, um, the states go much f uh, quicker to, to this solution and so I want to know if it's just an impression or if uh, something real. Well, let's see. We auctioned 700 megahertz back in 2007, 2008. So quite a while ago. We did our digital television transition in 2009. Uh, all at once, all across the country, sort of the big bang theory. A little different than the UK did it. Uh, but it seems to have worked. And we're moving on now to the 600 megahertz band where we re moved our broadcasters. But our thinking now is not about continuously moving them because I take your point that we actually have to provide some stability for these ongoing businesses. We are trying to identify among our broadcasters those who might be interested in getting out of the business of broadcasting and that's what our voluntary incentive auctions are about. So we are more for most purposes done with 700 megahertz and moving on to 600. 
Yeah. Oh, would you like to add to that? Yeah. Yes, add one thing and, and, and uh, also link back to, to what Jonathan said about it's, it's not uh, uh, either or here, and I fully agree, it's not either broadcasting or mobile broadband. I think we, we very much uh, uh, see uh, the way forward in, in a collaborative approach here, and, and, and of course we, we are now involved in, in, in research uh, where you would combine uh, a broadcasting uh, sort of high-mast uh, network with, a, with an LTE underlay network, uh, and I think uh, the way forward is definitely uh, to find this uh, cooperative approach uh, because uh, I think we both agree that, that uh, the demands of the consumers, the end users, will not be fulfilled by, by either, either solution. It will, will be the, uh, both mobile broadband and, and broadcasting. And I think that, that is the way forward, and, and I think we, we, that, that's the way we will work in Ericsson, definitely. Augusto, thank you. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, thank you very much. My name is Wolfgang Kleinwächter. I'm professor from the University of Aarhus and also a member of the ICANN board. We will have a discussion on internet governance later this afternoon, but my question goes to Jessica, because the future of the internet is mobile, and the future of the mobile industry is the internet. So these uh, two worlds are uh, very deeply interlinked, but they are based on a different governance model. So that means the Internet is more or less uh, managed and organized based on the multi-stakeholder model. The NTIA has just announced that they will uh, transfer uh, the, the, the responsibilities for YANA to a multi-stakeholder organization. But my understanding is the spectrum policy is not based on the multi-stakeholder model. It's regulated by the ITU and by government. So these are two different worlds. And my question to you is, you know, how do you see the interlinkage between the multi-stakeholder model for the government and the highly regulated uh, uh, ITU environment for the spectrum policy? Oh, that question's almost metaphysical. It's going to take me a little while <laughs> yeah. to answer. Um, and I appreciate that you're going to be talking about multi-stakeholderism, a word I didn't know until a few years ago, <laughs> and I can going forward. But I think your fundamental points are right. We are going to have to be in a continuous dialogue about these things. In the states in particular, some of our duties are in separate parts of the government, and we work reasonably well together. But as you point out, our Department of Commerce has responsibilities historically for the IANA contract and is engaging with ICANN in trying to develop this multi-stakeholder model. The FCC, where I work, is our spectrum town planner. We zone the skies. And these two things, the internet <coughs> and mobile, are converging at a rate that is radical. And we're going to have to figure out how we have a community that speaks consistently and constantly about these things together. So I think your point's a very good one. Just before I come to Peter Ulf or Jonathan, do you have a response on that one? Yeah, I, I can just say that, that uh, uh, if, if you look at uh, the development of, of, of mobile, of course, the uh, uh, reasons why it has been so, so successful is, of course, uh, open standards, global standards, harmonized spectrum, etc. And, and the fact that the majority of people connecting to the internet already now probably and going forward will be over mobile networks. So, so I mean, there has been a way. I mean, it's not either or here either. I mean, it's, it's, uh, the, the success of Internet is also based on, on, on the mobile technologies. So uh, most people will, will and, and then with the expansion of mobile broadband, we bring in the millions into the, the, the Internet world uh, via the mobile networks. So, so it has been supportive. But of course, it's a challenge. I mean, it, it, it rests with, with governments to be, uh, to have the foresight and, and, and understanding uh, uh, and, and uh, come to these agreements. We are in the hands of governments when it comes to the World Radio uh, uh, Conferences. That, that's a fact, and, and we just have to, uh, to work hard to make sure that the outcomes are, as, are good. Yeah. If, if you look at that article that Ericsson's written, there is an embedded frustration with WRC in there. Um, and and when, in a moment, we might come back to that. Jonathan, do you want to add to that yeah. or just rest? Uh, Peter. P Peter Lovelock, TRPC. My, my question's far more banal than the religious warfare between ICANN and ITU. But question to Jessica, I suspect Ulf and, and uh, Jonathan may have a response as well. You mentioned intriguingly um, shared spectrum and moving forward into shared spectrum. Intri the intriguing part was the database manager mm -hmm. that you've got there for the pilot that's coming forward. 
the database, uh, and I assume sh spectrum sharing is going to be fundamentally important going forward. The database for shared spectrum and dynamic spectrum allocation is one of the two or three crucial linchpins in this model. And I haven't seen anyone make it work from a business model perspective. Um, I come from Singapore, and one of the questions there is whether it needs to be uh, nationalised effectively, whether we need to have the state run the database until someone works out how the business model goes forward for that. It's obviously fundamentally important, that management aspect. So I'd just be interested in your, your comments on what you're doing with the pilot that's coming for the DSA stuff now. All right, uh, that's a very good point. The role of database managers in a world with shared spectrum, it's absolutely huge. We have decided, at least in the television bands, it doesn't need to be a single database administrator, doesn't need to be nationalized. We have two or three that we've authorized to do the same thing in the states. I think that is an interesting way to do it, and the fact that we've had two or three entities step up and decide to get in the business of doing it suggests to me that they do perceive a business opportunity there. But I will also tell you that our work on it is still limited because our television white spaces are in flux. With the work we're doing on the 600 megahertz band, it's not yet a stable environment. But I'm optimistic that we're going to develop business models for it because we've already seen private sector companies emerge. Yeah. Definitely, from, from Ericsson, we, we see that the uh, license shared is, is an interesting complement, I would say, uh, because we always see that li licensed uh, spectrum is, is the priority uh, with all the, the, the uh, sort of strong guarantees for quality of service, etc. But, but that being said, we, we see that, 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 that there, are, there is an interest here, and uh, it's quite complex, as Jessica already uh, uh, mentioned. But, but uh, to be used in, in, in combination with, with license spectrum through carrier aggregation, et cetera, I think it can, can do a lot to, to, to increase the capacity of, of, of networks. So, so definitely there's a way forward. I mean, we have the 3.5 in, in the U.S., uh, 2.3 uh, gigahertz looked into in Europe. So, so uh, definitely there's a way forward there. Uh, <coughs> Magnus Brook from ITV. Um, Jessica, uh, the, the incentive auction is fascinating, and, and, and um, one of the things we do from time to time is wonder whether we're in, we're in the wrong business. Should we be in the business of, of, of broking spectrum uh, rather than using it? And, and so far, we're, we're absolutely in the right business, which is broadcasting. Uh, but it's an interesting, it's an interesting thought. Um, and I just had a few questions about the incentive auction, I think. Um, uh, so are you going to get spectrum in the right place, is the first question. In other words, are the right people going to give up the spectrum where you need it? Uh, the second is, is there a reserve price? Who is taking the risk here uh, in, in potentially offering the spectrum? Um, and the third one was really about the, the presumption of license renewal, which is very mm -hmm. interesting. Is that something which broadcasters enjoy? In other words, to, to, in a sense, to Jonathan's point, how much certainty do broadcasters mm -hmm. have going forwards? Uh, and indeed, who, who bears the costs of, of if you like, replanning broadcasting as a result of various people giving up various bits of spectrum, uh, there's kind of a cost to that potentially from a broadcaster's point of view. Who, who is going to meet that cost? Ah, oh, good questions. Um, I have to just start by telling you that in an earlier life when I worked on the legislative side in Washington on Capitol Hill, I had the privilege of coming up with some of the ideas behind the incentive auction. And just being the idea generator is sort of a blissful thing. Being those, you know, sitting in the position of actually putting it into <laughs> into place is an entirely different task. So we are wrestling with some of these things right now. So the answers I'll give you will be largely intermediate. But how do we get it in the right place? It's a good question. We are a, a big country. We have roughly 210 media markets. In all of those markets, the demand for mobile broadband is not the same thing. It is clear to me that in the top 30 markets, that is where the demand is the greatest, in the densest places, frankly, where 5G network topology will be the most important going forward. I think the tool we have is, frankly, to compensate the broadcasters that seek to return spectrum in the markets we need it most at a higher rate. And about two weeks ago, the agency released a preliminary set of numbers giving most of our broadcasters a sense of the range that we could value their spectrum at. And it's clear, if you look at that just casually, that in markets where there is more demand for mobile services, those licenses are, are going to be worth more in our reverse auction. So 
Our tool is to pay more. Uh, reserve prices. Oh, reserve prices are, con are complicated because we've got reserve prices in the forward auction and in the, the we're going to have to figure out how to get to a sweet spot for all of these things. I will tell you right now, particularly on the broadcast side, we are thinking of having a descending clock auction, that there's a price at which we're willing to strike. We'll start up high and see if we can encourage the broadcaster to meet us at that price. Presumption of license renewal. I would say that that has historically been something that our broadcasters have enjoyed unless they uh, prove to be unfit to have a broadcast license. So I don't think that that presumption is exclusive to mobile operators. I think it's also something that generally our broadcasters enjoy and our license terms for broadcasters are right now eight years. Um, Cordell. Right. Thank you. Louis. Yes, Luis Lucatero from Mexico. I, I have a question for, for, for the entire panel and, 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 uh, and the, um, the chairman. Um, you know, we, we talk about uh, white spaces all the time <coughs> and, um, and the possibility of unlicensed spectrum to, to, great, uh, to, 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 ha to yield great, uh, great, great things. Now, uh, something that we have seen is that wherever unlicensed spectrum has yielded uh, amazing things, has been wherever we have fixed networks that can be used as backhauling. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you look at rural deployments worldwide, they have been done by licensed spectrum holders, not by unlicensed spectrum holders, because you have a backhauling problem that actually uh, makes things extremely complicated. So um, the question I have is how, how um, can, we, can we manage the expectations for the rural world where you have no fiber and no backhauling mechanisms and, 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 and couple that with unlicensed uh, um, white space spectrum. Thank you. Jonathan, do you? Uh, That's no. probably more one of my fellow panelists there of expertise. Yes, uh, l let, let me start. And, and it's no, no secret, I guess, that, that we are uh, uh, not, not, as Ericsson, promoting white space. We, we are pr promoting uh, 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 licensed uh, spectrum. But I think. If you go back, instead of looking at the technology solution, uh, in this case, uh, 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 white space, looking at what is the challenge, namely reaching out to, to, to yet uh, unconnected uh, uh, regions in, in, in uh, sometimes also very poor countries. I think what, what you need to do there is, is look at, at sort of incentives for uh, the operators to, to build out networks there. That could be made in different ways. I mean. Definitely uh, shared networks, uh, uh, either shared networks, I mean commercially shared networks be, being agreed to by the, uh, by the uh, regulators. We had that system in Sweden for, for 3G build out, four, four operators, uh, uh, two networks be being built out. And you can share in, in sort of the 70%, covering 70% of the population. Um, of course, uh, there, there is the, the option for some countries, like uh, Mexico, of course, uh, with, with a wholesale operator, uh, but of course requires funding, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, so I think that uh, that could, of course, be license obligations on, on the, uh, the operators when, when you sign on to a license, that you need have a coverage requirement also in remote areas. So I think you, you need to work with, with a toolkit here. Uh, to, to, to find the solutions. That's how we, we, we would see it from, 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 from Ericsson's side. I mean, uh, I, we see also the challenges that you uh, refer to when it comes to, to, to white space, of course. So, so I think that uh, there are ways, uh, it will not be easy, but, but uh, I think there are ways how you could, could sort of lower the thresholds for investments in, in, in these uh, areas. And of course, spectrum needs to be available, so we need the low, the low frequency spectrum below one gigahertz. That, that's a prerequisite, of course, as well. I think you bring up a really simple but important point, which is that wireless also needs wires. And that for all of our work, zoning the airwaves and reallocating spectrum and repurposing spectrum, it'll all be for naught if we don't also think about wire backhaul. And uh, that's vitally important and doesn't get the airtime it should. Lewis, I know you well enough to know that you never ask a question you don't know the answer to. Right. Um, <laughs> um, I'm very fond of our friend here, and one of the great benefits of these international conferences 
Mexico did great work with the APT 700. They were very bold, whole of government approach, social policy development. Uh, and I sat on the Public Safety Agency breakout session yesterday where um, I, I learnt an enormous amount of what Mexico has done in that space. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. Bob, I think you wanted to follow up on that, didn't you? TV white space in rural is that there are fewer broadcasters. And so there's actually more vacant spectrum. So you can channel bond. And what you can then do is use it as backhaul. There's a misperception that the TV white space will go directly to devices. That may happen in the future, but the ecosystem on chips don't exist. And so the most interesting uses of the TV white space, for example, in Africa, uh, have been in areas where there are no broadcast stations, right? You can have a digital dividend with no digital transit, uh, transition because there's no transition to transition out of. You bond the channels, you get long distance at very nice 600, 700 megahertz, and then you use the Wi-Fi retransmission to the, to the devices. So it's actually a very nice complementary use. The issue is there are a lot of TV channels in urban, so getting enough spectrum from the, for TV white space in urban is more difficult, but in rural, it's much less of an issue. So there's much more allocated but unassigned TV spectrum in the rural areas, and that is what white space actually is. It's the opportunistic use of allocated but unassigned spectrum. So it's really nice for the rural areas, precisely for backhaul. Thank you, Robert, for that contribution. I'm going to come to my lawyer friend here. Thanks, Chris. Um, and I might add that I'm also proud to be wearing the green and gold <laughs> for my team. Karen Edmondson from South Africa, a regulatory lawyer. <laughs> uh, yesterday, we had a lot of discussion about consolidation. So I am particularly interested in the concept of consolidation where operators have important bands of spectrum. Um, in South Africa, the allocation of spectrum for LTE has been a bit slow. And as a result, there's a couple of transactions that are proposed to be taking place so that operators can gain access to one another's spectrum. Um, acknowledging that this is a scarce resource and that efficient use is obviously paramount and also bearing in mind that spectrum is usually allocated to a specific operator based on either their auction price or other qualifications i'd be very interested um, jessica and maybe even jonathan on your views um, particularly in light of the fcc pronouncements on some of the mergers or, or other transactions that have been proposed where spectrum transfers would have resulted um, and I note your comments on spectrum sharing being something that you're looking at going forward. But that would be on a regulated basis, whereas these transfers would be uh, in, a, in a sort of unregulated way, um, just a way to get access to this important resource outside the regulatory regime. Well, let's see. Uh, we have transactions before us, which I can't speak about right now but I can tell you that our general process has two elements. Any transaction gets reviewed by our antitrust authorities at the Department of Justice, and that's a traditional view to identify if that consolidation of market power results in a non-transitory price increase and reduction in innovation. And to the extent that they see a problem, they'll act. At the FCC, we have a broader mandate to assess those transactions on the basis of the public interest. And traditionally, that includes a review of spectrum. And part of that spectrum review will be identifying if there are some markets where simply too much spectrum is held by the combined operator. That could result in saying no to the transaction, or it could result in us requesting that in particular markets they sell their spectrum on a secondary market basis. So that's our 
way of looking at these things. That's the prism through which we evaluate the transactions that are before us that involve spectrum. But I can't speak with any more specificity on what's before us right now. My friend, you've been very patient. Very short, but one comment first. Um, uh, Sven Eric Horn from Bird and Bird. Uh, this is what you were just saying, Jessica, is exactly what uh, the German regulator is currently doing with regard to the uh, Telefonica E Plus merger. Despite uh, the uh, antitrust decision on the European level, um, it is the German regulator now uh, actually trying to take away spectrum uh, from the entity, um, actually based on the same argumentation that the EU has said uh, that there would not be a distortion of competition. So it's an inter interesting question mm -hmm. of competence there. Um, my question is short uh, to the entire panel. Uh, when do you expect uh, multi-jurisdictional frequency awards and or auctions? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, you won't want me to give a date or a year <laughs> or? <laughs> no, I mean, uh, I think it's, it's, it's obvious that, that I mean, uh, coming from an, an representing sort of an industry uh, which is see the, the tremendous benefits of harmonization and scale, et cetera, uh, I think th that would be a welcome development. But, uh, but uh, it's, uh, of course, we have a new, co new commission now, but, but this, is, uh, this is a very, sensitive issue for, for many governments that still consider it to be, I mean, this is part of sort of, I don't know, na national responsibility and security, etc. But the, in, in principle, I think uh, we would welcome uh, uh, anything that, that would uh, help to, to drive scale and thereby efficiencies and thereby uh, lower cost and more benefits to the end user. I'll just agree. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I agree to that. Um, it, it, it's an evolution that will happen, but no time soon. Um, so, uh, Chris Pierce from Canada. Um, just a quick follow on Jessica to your comments on the incentive auction. As you know, Canada can sometimes be a quotes fast follower. What mm -hmm. you at the FCC do, but what's your current sense of that? I, I gather your tool for attracting the broadcasters is price. Mm -hmm. um, what's your current sense of their appetite to to come to the table? That's a good question. Obviously, give it's us a prediction. <laughs> yeah, um, I think it is challenging to know because we have a community of broadcasters that wish to remain in the business of broadcasting. I want them to be able to have a full and fair opportunity to do so. Their primary interest is in the repacking, so that they're not harmed if they get relocated, that they don't lose geographic coverage or population coverage. We have another community, marginal broadcasters not affiliated with any of our national networks or public television, who might find this attractive. So what has become apparent to me is that our broadcasting community is not a monolith. And as an agency tasked with holding these auctions, I think we have to start having different dialogues with different communities. And the first effort to do that was to offer them all a range of price and see who comes back to us and starts talking to us and seeking more details. I think those that want to stay in broadcasting are far better organized for obvious reasons, and those who are marginal broadcasters who might be willing to exit the business, they don't have an easy association. So we're going to have to figure out how to have different conversations with different types of broadcasters. That's just starting to emerge right now. Cass Calva, Calva International. I think we've had a very good discussion on spectrum planning, spectrum um, allocation, and spectrum auctions. We haven't talked about spectrum trading and spectrum fees, and it's this last point I wanted to raise, because my sense is that on almost every continent now, uh, regulators, treasuries, and spectrum authorities are uh, revising their annual spectrum fees, uh, increasing number of them. Uh, this is causing consternation with operators. I, uh, we, we were working with one operator where their stock value literally uh, dropped several percentage points when the government announced a new proposal for uh, uh, having new spectrum fees on an annual basis. Uh, on the other hand, governments are saying, look, uh, you know, we, we gave, sometimes it's license renewal, we gave this to you for free. 
uh, you want to continue holding it, uh, we're going to impose some kind of fee using royalties, auction benchmarking, uh, AIP, or whatever method. So I just wanted to see if anyone on the panel had some view as to uh, should we be talking at convocations like this about what's the right framework for reassessing annual spectrum fees, uh, how should it be done, uh, should it be done differently in different areas of the world or different types of situations or different bands. Uh, maybe for the next uh, year's session there should be something that focuses a little bit more on this, but if anyone has some initial thoughts, I would be very glad to hear them. Ulf, I, I can give us two, two general views. I, I th as I said in my, my intervention, I think it's important that, that the value of spectrum is, is being recognized and, and uh, those users that have not been used to paying for, for the spectrum should probably get starting to get used to that. So, so that's the general principle because we know this, uh, we talked about this all this, 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 uh, this morning, uh, the value of, of a spectrum is just increasing so, so it would be uh, unwise I think not to, to, to look into that, so sort of to bring in every, every spectrum holder uh, in, into a more uh, fairer, a more fair scheme so to speak. That's the one thing. And secondly, I mean just I think it's important uh, talk about sort of connecting rural areas in, 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 in let's say in Africa and other emerging markets. Uh, I think it's also important for governments to, to realize when you have spectrum auctions, not, not go for the big sort of revenue down payment, uh, but instead recognizing the benefits of connectivity, benefits of, of, of mobile broadband, and, and sort of moderate the, the uh, appetite sort of for, for, for large down payments, and, and then look at, at uh, sort of more uh, 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 sort of siphon off some of the revenues that will inevitably come if, if, if when networks are being built out and, 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 and people are getting connected and you see the benefits and to the whole of society. So that's just the second point. Probably got time for just two more questions. I'll come here and here. Just on that, in Australia we've started to bleed in opportunity costing, perhaps in our whole 400 megahertz band review. There's an annual reset based on opportunity costs in um, metropolitan. The fees have gone up. In the metros, it's gone up. In uh, regional, it's roughly stayed the same. And remote Australia, it's significantly gone down. There was a net net loss to Treasury in Australia as a result of the introduction of opportunity costing. Um, Treasury took it on the chin, but that's because <laughs> in splendid isolation, it wasn't a big hit. Um, one of the we we uh, produce a what we call FISO, a five-year rolling um, forward look of our work programs. We've just released our latest FISO report. One of the things that we're going to be concentrating on calendar 2015 is greater transparency, particularly in government holdings, of the amount of government holdings. People, um, w we know it well, but I think the average punter would be shocked as to what percentage of spectrum is held by government. In our case, it's approaching 50%. They would be equally shocked by the comparative, um, uh, the comparative amounts not paid by government. Um, so we need to give a lot more light to that. Uh, transparency to that will be significantly uh, improve uh, pressure on government to uh, allow a much more holistic view. Um, fascinating example in the uh, digital dividend auction we had last year. Um, the ACMA is pretty pure economic, rationalist, efficiency orientated. Our reserve price for that 700 megahertz was dramatically lower than what ultimately the government wanted through the ministerial direction. I think it was $1.36 per megahertz per pop in Australia. Uh, the net net of all that was we only sold two thirds of that spectrum, raising $2 billion and you can't really ever compute whether you would have got more but uh, if you had allowed what we saw as the reserve price to allow price discovery. So those ad hoc government decisions in Australia were totally contrary to the best interests of an efficient and effective allocation. So I just make that observation. Michael. <coughs> Thank you, uh, Chris. William Stuckey from ICASA, the South African regulator. First of all, I'd like to support Ulf's comments about not going overboard and auction 
uh, uh, prices. Secondly, Chris, we introduced, uh, administrative, we introduced administrative incentive pricing in South Africa in 2012, um, and we provide a 90% discount if you're outside the metros. Um, and then thirdly, I'd to just to comment further on Robert's uh, a comment about the TV white spaces in South Africa. Um, there are two. The one, uh, the Cape Town one was conducted last year. There were seven free channels uh, in Cape Town. They used three base stations um, to connect ten schools. Um, and all the channels used were um, adjacent to something else. So, for example, uh, one of the base stations used channel 27, which had an analog chan transmission in channel 27, uh, 26, and a digital transmission in channel 28. I won't comment f on our digital traditional transmission uh, uh, transition any further than to say that we have had it on running for three years, but it's not officially switched on. In Limpopo, um, and that was using, by the way, Carlson equipment with Newell software, and the Limpopo trial is, in, and that was in a dense urban area. The Limpopo trial is in a rural, hilly, wooded area um, using six harmonic equipment collecting five schools at up to about 10 kilometers each. Uh, both, both have been successful in doing so um, in Limpopo, the 21 free channels, um, and no interference has been detected. last uh, comment. G given all the influential people in the room and the regula regulators in the room, the, the further comment was um, the benefits of TV white spaces used for disaster recovery because there are some elegant solutions now coming forward based opportunistically on being able to deploy TV white spaces around disaster recovery, solutions that were used in the Philippines, in, in Japan, in Vietnam. Um, it's just another area that people need to look at and the regulators need to get across. That, that was all. We're going to uh, keep the cr cricket analogy going, draw stumps for lunch. Uh, thank you to our three panellists. I think we successfully triangulated a number of perspectives. Um, Jonathan and all, thank you very much. And uh, Jessica, you were a star witness. So uh, thank you very much for that. Um, just um, a reminder that the, I I'll be sending uh, the paper that the ACMA has written on nine areas of policy reform in spectrum policy reform. I'll be sending it out to each of you through the Secretariat. I'd love to get some feedback as to whether you know there's a, a 10th, 11th and 12th. Um, so see what you think of that. Australia is um, an island state uh, relatively uncomplicated. If there's a country that should be able to effectively transform quickly its radio communications framework. It is Australia. I hope, and I genuinely believe, and I hope I'm not naive, that by the end of calendar 15 we'll be introducing legislation to completely uh, reform our uh, Radio Communications Act. Let's, let's see whether that transpires. Um, Andrew's reminded me that the breakout sessions will start at uh, 10 to 2. Uh, there's a choice of three interactive breakout sessions, and do you want me to add to that? Okay. Um, again, to our panellists, thank you. Thank you to participants. Wonderful panel. Thank you.